Let's finish off this uh, set of problems. One thing I keep uh, forgetting to mention is some terminology. Now that we are actually doing D on more than just functions, um, we well, I want to just give the name to it. It's called uh, the exterior derivative. Um, and we are, we've actually been doing exterior algebra, and there's still more things we could say. That's the wedge product. And then exterior calculus is, is using that wedge product and the D um, to do the differential forms. So exterior calculus is really just another name for the, the study of, ex of differential forms. Um, and the exterior is in contrast to interior derivative, which is a rather different notion that I will not talk about at all, but it's just, we could just treat it as a name. Um, so speaking of D, we've discovered some interesting things about it. Um, often you'll see a summary of the most important properties to be, uh, there's a list of four properties that people usually use, and three of them make no mention of explicit coordinates at all, which is really nice, and when you get to more advanced uh, stage on this kinds of stuff, um, then that's, it turns out to be very crucial to see what you can do without explicit coordinates. One of them, um, almost always you'll see in, written out in explicit coordinates, it's the zero form case, the fact that it basically encodes the gradient, but just in the one form version. Um, but then there's linearity, just that sums and, and uh, constants come out. There's this very intriguing property we've discovered, and we still want to think about more, which is d of d of something is zero, or the way to summarize that is d squared is the zero operator. Um, and that, we'll, we'll come back to the consequences, some of the consequences of that. Um, then the fourth one, though, that you'll usually see in that list <coughs> is, um, what about the product rule? How does D interact with the wedge product? So here's some stuff that we're going to get to in a minute. One thing is that we've seen already one case of that. Let me go back up to the top of this thing. If you have a function wedge a, a basis one form, just dx, uh, then there's a very simple rule. It's just you differentiate the f and you leave the dx alone, treat it as a constant. But if this were not a constant one form, it's a little bit uh, more sketchy. Now it turns out that if this is d of any function, by the sort of the change of variables argument, or by explicit calculation, you'll still get this. But what if it's a one form that isn't just d of something? So we'd like to be able to, uh, to understand it in general. So we're going to do that by sneaking up on it. Um, and again, the real way to do this is try to do this as a problem set and just use these video, the video as hints as you go along. Um, but I'm just going to barrel right through it, and it's up to you to pause it if you want to do it yourself. Okay, so let's calculate the wedge product of two functions is really just the ordinary product. And so we're going to calculate this guy, and we're going to kind of hope it equals um, df wedge, D wedge g plus f wedge dg, because that would be the analog of the ordinary product rule. Okay, well... Uh, that's just a function, and so we're going to take its derivatives. There's nothing really special about doing this in R3. I just thought it'd be more familiar. Oh, and then there's a dx here. Um, it's a little more writing. We could do it in R2 and get the whole impact, but let's just go ahead and do it in R3. Okay, well, this is an ordinary partial derivative. This is just the partial with respect to x of f times g. There, the product rule totally applies. So that's fx g plus fgx all times dx. And let's copy and paste that. OK. And then these are just going to be y, 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 and z, z, z. OK, now what are we heading towards? Oh, something where we separate out all the stuff that has f derivatives in it. Oh, yeah, we can do that. Uh, this is one thing that has f derivatives in it, and that got paired with a dx. Here's another thing that has an f derivative in it, and here's the last thing. Okay, and then plus, <coughs> and then you can see that it's exactly the same, but where the derivative is actually on the g. And that's pretty easy to do with a little editing. Okay. And so that is e indeed equal to df wedge g plus f wedge dg. Cool. Okay. So, so far so good. It looks like the ordinary product rule. Okay. Um, now what about f wedge a random one form? That's what I was alluding to before. Now we can still write that as just f times alpha in the usual way. Okay. What is that going to be equal to? Oh, in fact, I already calculated this. I actually did a dry run of this, and I actually already have it here. Let's see. Um, oh yeah, I needed to change this. This was why, okay. All right, so let's go back up to here. Um, 
let's be let's do a simple case. Let's not just do let's not do PDX plus QDY plus RDZ. That'd be overkill because if it works for PDX, it's going to work for the other two, and it's and it's going to work for a sum. So let's just do a little special case where alpha is a, a function times dx. Is the d of a product equal to what we'd expect it to be over here? Well, f alpha is just f times pdx. Oh, fp, that's just a function. OK, and we know how to do function times dx and take the d of that. It's just d of fp wedge dx. And hey, guess what? Look, we just did that. We just did d of, of a product. We know the product rule works. So we expand that out. And then uh, we just uh, distribute it. df wedge pdx, hey, that's df wedge alpha, because that's just alpha. So that goes df wedge alpha, good. And then f wedge dp wedge dx, well, let's see, dp wedge dx, oh yeah, that's what I would get if I took d of alpha. So indeed, it works, OK. It still works. OK, now let's go down to something that looks suspiciously similar. d of alpha wedge f. But wait a minute, isn't that the same? If it's a zero form, it's a function. This is just scaling. It's not anti-commutative. It's just plain old commutative here. So this guy, it seems like there shouldn't be any, any real reason to check this case, maybe. But in fact, there is a very good reason to check this case. OK. We already know the answer to this. It's just d of f alpha. And so we can just write it down. And we're done, right? Well, read really carefully what we'd like this to be equal to. We would like it to be equal to d alpha wedge f plus alpha wedge df. That's different from what we have here. Okay, um, The f wedge d alpha and the d alpha wedge f, that's the same. Okay, So that's true, d alpha wedge f, because I can uh, commute those because it's just a function. Plus, well, wait a minute. Alpha wedge df, this is a one form, and this is another one form. Oh, we know those guys anti-commute. This is df wedge alpha, so it's actually minus alpha wedge df. And this is the hint of what's really going on. We're going to get a product rule, but sometimes it's going to be a plus, and sometimes it's going to be a minus. So it really is it has a wonderful product rule, and it's really important and cool, but it has some pluses or minuses. Just like when we uh, multiply, when we do wedge products, we have to be careful with signs. Okay, So um, that's going to be interesting. Let me do a little diversion. I, one other thing I real I just realized um, a digression from this problem set, but it's to something that we I did do with my class, and we really should do right now. Just plain algebra. If um, alpha is a p form, uh, and beta is a q form, then what do we get? How do alpha wedge beta and um, beta wedge alpha compare? Oops, come on. We know that if one of them is a zero form, it's just a function, and it doesn't matter what order we, we, we put it in. We know that if they're both one forms, then it's a minus. Well, what if they have just something more general, um, a general P and Q? So let's just do an example out. Suppose we had like dx wedge dy wedge dz. And to be in, uh, to give us enough variables to play with, let's say we have variables x, y, and z, and like a and b, a, b, and c. Actually, let's see. Let's do dx wedge dy and then da wedge db wedge dc, just for fun. OK. Is this equal to the same uh, da wedge db wedge dc wedge dx wedge dy? Can we just reverse the order? Well, all we have to do is we just have to use the fact that we know what happens for one forms. Um, the parentheses are totally unnecessary. But the order does matter. And I'm just going to have to figure out, OK, if I want to put all the a, b, and c in front, so the D, getting the dA in front, I need to switch it past both the x and the y. OK, so that's going to be a minus 1 to the 2 power, because I've done a mi that minus 1 switch twice. And then times, let's see, I want to get the dB in front. The expense of that is going to be a minus 1 to the 2 power again, because I'm switching the B. And remember, the A is in front already. The B is going to switch past the x and y. 
and then the DC has to switch past the X and Y as well. Okay, so I've got um, two times three switches, basically. And then the DX and the DY end up at the end. And what is this? It's minus one to the two times three. Because for each of the one forms here, each of these three one forms had to switch by it. Okay. Hopefully, you can see what's going to happen is that alpha wedge beta is going to be minus 1 to the PQ beta wedge alpha. So this is the more general form of the anti-commutativity. We knew it had to be true for one forms because there's some pretty deep reasons about orientation. And that uh, implies this rule for, uh, for P and Q forms. And now we're seeing another place where minus has come up. We don't know exactly what the systematics of it are, but we've seen that sometimes there's a plus in the product rule, sometimes there's a minus. Let's look at what happened. When they're both zero forms, it was plus. When this was a zero form and this was a one form, it was still plus. But when this was a one form this was a zero form, it switched to minus. You might even have a guess right from there. Okay. But let's look at a few more calculations. Okay. D of PDX wedge QDY, and then I actually went ahead and did the first step for us here. Okay, and we'd like to know is it equal to this mass? Well, let's expand it out. Okay, um, we're just going to get PQ, come on, PQX um, uh, oh yeah, if this is going to be, remember when we have the derivative of something that's a two form, it simplifies pretty well, because I would get a PQX DX, but that's going to die. I would get a PQY, but that's going to die because the DY, which DY is going to be zero. So it's just going to be PQZ DZ wedge DX wedge DY. Okay, and now I just use the product rule. So actually, this isn't even as complicated as the last one in some ways. Uh, it's not what I meant. Q, oh, no subscript, plus PQZ just the ordinary product rule and then times all this stuff copy and paste okay so now that's gonna split into a part where the P is derivative differentiated and where the Q is differentiated so let me just go ahead and copy and paste again take that out so plus and then I'm gonna copy and paste one more time and take the other part out okay and I don't really need the parentheses Okay, so there is the answer. What about all this stuff? Let's go ahead and evaluate that. It's a new, have a new uh, displayed math here. D of P dx, oh, that's easy. That's just dp wedge dx wedge q dy plus, and then this is going to be pretty similar. Let me just actually copy and paste again. Uh, that's just dq wedge dy. Okay. You might want to just stop and think about this, even if you haven't done it on your own. Just uh, pause it for a second. Make sure this is making sense to you. Now, the dp, again, we want to expand that out in terms of partial derivatives. But um, we don't have to use a partial x because I've got a dx in here. I don't have to use a partial y because there's a dy in here. Okay. So it's just going to be p sub z dz. So notice how when you keep remembering this anti-commutativity and the fact that a lot of things automatically die, it prevents you from writing a lot of stuff down that you then later learn it wasn't really necessary. And then P, DX, Q, D, Q, again, we're just going to need a Q, Z here. And um, that's just going to be Q, Z, D, Z. Okay. Now what are we getting? And we have to be very, very careful with the signs here. These guys both were in the in the order z x y, okay. <clears throat> this is in the order z x y. This is in the order x z y. That's interesting, okay. So that looks like it might might screw us up, but we can fix it after the fact. So p z, I'm going to put them both in the order z x y. So that's p z q, just combining the function parts, and then the rest of it is indeed d z d x d y. That's exactly this guy. Okay, but this would be a plus p q z. This would be a minus when we switch the x and the z to be in this order. That's not going to work. Okay, so this guy is wrong 
to match with this guy, but we know how to fix it. We just put a minus here. Then that's going to put a minus here. That's going to put a minus here. And that's going to change that to plus, which is what we actually had here. So it looks like D of one form wedge one form, we get the, um, the product rule, but now we get a minus again. OK. So tell you what, um, I'm going to just stop the video here. I'm not going to do this last example. This is one form wedge two form. Um, just If you just work it out real carefully, I'll tell you what you find. You find you still need a minus sign. And I'm going to go ahead and give away the rule here. So definitely stop the video now if you don't want it to give it, be given away. OK. So the rule here is if alpha is a p form, I need to know that. And I actually don't need to know the degree of p. It's d alpha wedge beta plus minus 1 to the p alpha wedge d beta. I'll tell you the, uh, the, hard, the easy rule for that. Um, it's, a, it's, a, like it's akin to this rule. This, remember this, where this rule came from. The minus 1 to the pq came from the fact that whenever we switch sort of basic objects, in this case one forms with each other, we incur a minus sign. And whenever we have a p form, like alpha, we think of it as being made up as p basic objects, one forms, multiplied together, because that's exactly how you make it. And all you have to remember is we want to remember, we want to think of d as acting kind of like a one form in terms of the sign convention. So when we don't switch the order of anything, including the d, we need no minus sign. But here, notice when we put the d on the beta, we switched it through the alpha. And it turns out to give you the right answer, the right sign convention, is if you pretend that's kind of like switching a one form with alpha, which would give you a minus 1 to the p times 1, which is just a minus 1 to the p. That is the fourth rule. Oh, I'll leave it there. Uh, that's the fourth rule that goes in here. The product, or it's also called the Leibniz rule, if you want to be fancy about it. And it's a signed version, it's a sort of funky signed version of the ordinary product rule from calculus.